Lucy Wolf, and we're here with Nick Sturms. And you're watching Dark City Interviews. All right, so we're here, CMA Fest, last day of CMA Fest. Yes, ma'am. Are you feeling pretty tired? I'm a little bit worse for the wear, but it's okay. All right, well, me too. My voice is gone, guys, so bear with me. I've been talking to everybody and all kinds of fans. Um, so you are a songwriter. Yes, ma'am. And you are a singer. And I and pretend I, to be. <laughs> you're an awesome performer. We caught you on the Chevy stage. and. Um, all kinds of people were rooting for it. It was really fun, and um, your songs were, were really great. But I think there's a lot of things people don't know about Nick Sturms. You have written some amazing songs for some pretty big people and some pretty big things. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, when I was 16 years old, I moved here, and I got a publishing deal uh, with Miss Lisa Johnson, and she has stuck with me for a decade now. Okay. So uh, I think I've got the longest running pub deal in town. <laughs> um, I don't know, I just, I started, I had my first semi-hit with Air Supply when I was 16, 17. It's the last thing they ever put out. Uh, it was called Hold Me Like You Love Me. I don't know, it got on the adult contemporary charts. Pretty cool. Yeah, yeah um, very, very nice. And I've had tons of songs recorded by other people uh, from, and in several genres, big, small. It's like, I think one of my early cuts was a punk rock song, like, and I had, it started as a country song. They recorded it as a punk rock song. Wow, what was that like? Um, it was definitely interesting to hear it, you know, so interpretive. I mean, music is a universal language. And a well-written song can be any kind of song. It's just music. Just change, change the beat behind it. All of a sudden, you've got a samba. All of a sudden, you've got jazz. It's, it's, uh, it's crazy how it can work out. Um, but... I was going to say, as the songwriter, if you wrote it to be country and you heard that it was changed, did it, some people, I think it, it might affect them, it might bother them, but it doesn't seem to bother you. Oh, not at all. I love it. I mean, think about some of the greatest songs of all time. I mean, Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You. Amazing song. Dolly Parton. Yeah. She, you know, and yeah. they're nothing alike, and yet they're both perfect. So yeah, the delivery on Whitney Houston's was so powerful, and I, it was a completely different take on it, and it was a really, really awesome hit. Um, and that, that one is referenced a lot, actually. Yeah. I was just talking to some fans earlier in the week, and they brought that one up, so that one, it's, I'm glad you said that. The most perfectly written love song ever, because it asks for nothing in return. <laughs> right. So, okay, so writing songs for you. The thought process. What, what, what goes on? What, what do you think about when you're you know, getting ready to put a song together. I show up to the well and stay out of the way. I think it's, uh, Doug Johnson told me this and it was, he's uh, one of the most amazing songwriters in the world. He wrote Three Wooden Crosses, he wrote Skin. Uh, he said over 40 top tens, I think 13 number ones, 14 number ones. Um, but he told me when I was 16 or 17, he says, man, the best you can hope for is be the pencil. Every song that's ever been written, every song that ever will be written is out there floating somewhere. And all you can hope is to be the pencil. And if you stay out of the way, the song will be better for it. And, uh, and that's, that's kind of my process. I show up, I pick up guitar. I say, okay, I'm at the well, let's try and draw water. And I just start playing, something comes out. And normally, I don't stop to edit. So I'll just go, get on a roll, try and work it out. In about 20, 30 minutes, I've got a song. Then I'll go back mm. and look and say, ooh, or is everything right? Now what can I make better? But there's no point in missing out on an entire verse because I got hung up on one line. Right, oh, that's good. That's a good way to think about it too. So what kind of advice would you give to another songwriter? Just the less you try to color something with yourself, the, if you remove your ego from the equation and you go, I'm just gonna show up today and pray that something happens. You're gonna get something. May not be perfect, but you know, Paul McCartney's yesterday started off as scrambled eggs, oh my baby, how I love your legs. It was a, he had a whole song with these nonsensical lyrics, but it was because he just got on a roll and was mm -hmm. like, okay, I know the melody's right. I can come back and change the words. I know that that was, that was my next question. Do, oftentimes you have this melody that you hear in your head first and then you just try to find words to it. But usually it's just kind of all, all in one. I'll just pick up the guitar and I'll just start jamming. And it's like, okay, I like this riff or I like 
I like this chord progression, and then you just kind of just start singing and find what feels right. Mm -hmm. It's just a, it's a very uh, organic process. That's really good. Okay, now when did you start learning to play the guitar? Um, when I was in diapers. I mean, my, my dad played for George Strait my whole life, so growing up around that, music was just... So you, you were pretty much force-fed like music. You had that interest. It was in your blood. Yeah, when I was a baby, uh, there's pictures of me that are hysterical, but they always told me if I started crying, the only way they'd give me stop is they'd put my high chair to the piano, and the second I could start touching the keys, I'd be fine. Wow. And you hear, you hear stories where, you know, people are always, you know, giving music early and, and everything, but I've not heard that one yet. I have not heard put a high chair in front of a piano. Yeah. But that's a good trick for all you parents out there who uh, have some new ones. <laughs> <laughs> Get a piano and a high chair. Um, that's, that's really fun. Do you have pictures of that? I do. Okay, that would be fun to see. I'll send you one. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> all right. So, um, you, have, you have a song out. That you have a current single. Yes, ma'am. And it's on Serious XM. Serious Okay, what, what is that? It's called Amen. And I wrote it when I was uh, 16 or 17 with a great friend of mine, Mr. Mark Stephen Jones. And he wrote uh, Red, White, and Pink Slip Blues for Hank Jr., um, The Lonely for uh, Toby Keith. I mean, he's had a string of hits too. Phenomenal writer. And we were sitting there one day and we just started kind of riffing on this. This oh, 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 and that was all we had. We had the chords and that. And we're like, okay, this sounds like this sounds like slavery. This sounds like prison. Mm. And we're like, man, there haven't been a prison song in a long time. Let's do it. So we start writing this song, and we we fight, but it's it's because we're not fighting each other. We're fighting for the song, and and we go back and forth for like two hours on this one. This was a this was a hard one, wow. and. Uh, we wrote all the verses, but we couldn't get the chorus. We had no idea what the hook was. And we're like, okay, I know, I know what this is about. And uh, I, was, I was so wrong, like me, because the first line I wanted was, was something really artsy or, you know. Mm -hmm. And Mark just goes, amen. And I was like, that is awesome. So we start writing that chorus and it, it evolved into what it is. Um, and then it sat on a shelf for a great many years, and I went in to record my record, and I just said, man, I have to do this song. Right. I love this song so much. My producer freaked over it. Everybody loves it. Um, and I was really surprised when we sat down and were deciding a first single that everyone unanimously was like, amen, without a doubt, is the first single. Absolutely. It's the, it's the scariest, bravest song on there. It was like, this is either gonna work and people are gonna love it or it is going to to fail. And uh, I thank God it was the first and not the letter. <laughs> right, right, right. But you know, so that, that takes some courage to do that, you know, step out of your comfort zone and choose, you know, it's a bold move, but it, it worked. Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, I've always been kind of different. I've always been on the edge of country. And, and everyone's like, what do you mean you're edgy country? And it's like, well, I'm not Jason Aldean. I'm not the guy who's out there, you know, playing ACDC with, um, with country lyrics. What I try to do is I have the modern music, but I have the throwback to the old school. Like, I, I, I'm a strong, strong believer in lyrical integrity. No matter what the song's about, it can be well written. Um, and it, one of the things that people complain about a lot is, you know, there's lots of songs about trucks and lots of songs about <laughs> drinking. Yes. That's not even my problem. My problem is that 20 years ago, there were great songs about trucks. I mean, Joe Diffie, Pickup Man. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, th there were great songs about drinking. Um, Colin Ray um, had oh, yeah. a couple big ones. Like, and you just go, okay, why, why is it that we don't do that anymore? It's like, I'll, I'll listen to a drinking song all day long. Mm -hmm. Let's craft it, make it a, a great story, make it make you feel something. Right. You know, prop me up, set the jukebox. I mean, that's a <laughs> great song and an original idea. So uh, that's what I shoot for. It's like if I'm going to say something that's been said, let's find a new way to say it. Exactly. Now, out of all the songs you've written, is there one that is really just emotional for you? That is just it means 
the most to you? There's a couple of them. Uh, one, I was really lucky this year. I had a, a number one hit with uh, a song called The Hearts Are Leave Behind. They were with a guy named Travis Meadows. And uh, he, he has an amazing story. He's a cancer survivor. Um, he's been an artist and he's a very successful songwriter. Um, he was telling me about a tattoo he saw. And it said, um, to live in the hearts you leave behind is to never die. And I was like, that's, that's really cool. I was like, first off, I think we need to make it simpler. Like, I love what it says, but let's, yeah. let's narrow it down. And so we brought it into, you know, uh, I'll live in the hearts I leave behind. And we started writing this song. And this is just, it's, it's my eulogy. I mean, that's, that's what I want it to be. Uh, that's, I think that it's the kind of song that everyone who hears it wants that to be about them. And uh, we were really fortunate that it was played for Chris Kyle's wife um, by, by a friend of theirs. And she started crying and she's like, that, that, was, that was him. And then it kind of became his, his anthem. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, when the trial was over, I mean, it played on every news network and, and we donated all of the proceeds to, to Chris's charity. Oh wow! Uh, now see that I did not know. So that's but, uh, and can people still download that song? Absolutely. Is it still yeah, a guy named Pete Scoble and Winona Judd did a duet on it. It was a, it was awesome, and uh, you can go to iTunes and find it there. Or we have videos online everywhere with. I think there's three, four versions of it now that have been recorded. Uh, so you can find it one way or another. Wow, all right, so give us, give us your contact information. How, how would the fans be able to look you up? What, what is your... Um, Facebook would be Nick Sturms Official. My website is nicksturmsnation.com and Twitter, Nick Sturms. Perfect, all right, well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for taking the no time to, to speak with us. Until next time, guys, we'll see you soon. Later.